Netflix is investing big time on content from South Korea with plans to invest $2.5 billion over the next four years to produce more K-dramas, movies and reality shows. For more on the K-wave and what's so compelling about it, we're joined by Jan Wong. She was the Globe and Mail's Beijing correspondent in the 1980s and 90s. Good morning. Good morning, Stephanie. What explains Netflix investing so much in producing content from South Korea? The Korean Netflix dramas have been extremely popular and successful across cultures. And also, they've got a lot of subscribers in that area of the world. And I think with the uh, Oscar success of of, uh, Korean films, it's becoming much more mainstream. It's not just a little cult you know, side thing. I think many, many people have started trying to watch these dramas and are are really enjoying it. So I think they see the market there and they're moving in. What are some shows that you are watching? Well, my very first one, which I think I, I sort of just fell into during the pandemic when I was stuck at home, was Crash Landing on You. And it's about a gorgeous, uh, very rich South Korean businesswoman who is paragliding to promote her sportswear line, and she crash lands on the wrong side of the DMZ, the uh, militarized zone separating North and South Korea. And she lands in a tree, and she's captured by a North Korean soldier, an officer. And that's the premise, and then they fall in love. (laughs) (laughs) And it's so great. It's so great because... You know, I never, even though I was a Beijing correspondent, I never had a chance to go to North Korea. And I've always been fascinated by it. They invited me once, but they gave me 24 hours notice. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm a little busy. Can I go next weekend? (laughs) Apparently, you don't say that to North Korea. So I never got to see it. And what this is, it's, it's really the first drama that portrays North Koreans as ordinary human beings with the same emotions as you and I. And it was extremely popular. And you would think that you wouldn't understand it, but, oh, my God, it's so wonderful. So I recommend that as a a way to start. But I've seen so many now. I always have one on the go. Um, I recently saw uh, Extraordinary Attorney Wu, and that's about um, a a lawyer who, who is very smart, very successful, but also autistic. And it's her daily life in her law firm. And there's a paralegal guy uh, in her law firm who really likes her. And she doesn't really quite get it. And the other people in the law firm think he's just feeling pity for her and is doing, you know, being friends with her is a good deed, but he actually really likes her. So there's all this kind of stuff. And there's corporate espionage. There's um, uh, mafia stories. There's restaurant uh, dramas. It's really great. What do you think makes these shows so popular? I think there are universal themes of loneliness, of um, of anger, of mental illness, of romance, of trying to find the right person, or being alienated and and moving out of the city and going into you know a small village and trying to create a new life for yourself. They're just really appealing, and I think Korea deliberately set out in the 1990s to create this industry, and it is hugely successful. They looked at the success of movies like Titanic and Jurassic Park, and the box office take for those movies was more than Korea got from exporting cars. So the government made a decision to invest in the creative industries. No one else has ever done this before, and they are really successful. One of the things you have to know about K-dramas is that they don't take their clothes off. And you might have to wait 10 or 15 episodes for them to hold hands. But it's so thrilling when they finally do. And so if you if you basically watch Western stuff and, you know, within 15 minutes, within 15 minutes, they're in bed, they're naked. (laughs) It's completely different. And the reason Korean dramas do this is for their broad appeal so that they can export to the Middle East and to Pakistan and India. So they're consciously they're consciously creating these export products. And and I have to say, I just love them. Not everyone. So you start one. If you don't like it, you just move on to something else. This is being called a Korean wave. Can you tell us more about that? Well, it, it now has 
not just created this huge export of a Korean culture, it has actually rebranded the country. And that was part of the motivation for doing it. Korea used to be a very poor country. It came out of the Korean War even poorer than the North, which many people don't understand. And they wanted to rebrand. So there's a lot of product placement in these in these K-dramas. So LG, for instance. LG is a brand a lot of people don't even realize it's Korean, but people like LG, like LG stoves, LG fridges, and the cars. Kia used to be a laughing stock among cars, but not anymore. Now Korean cars are uh, looked are, are are coveted. People want to buy them. There's people buy Hyundai cars, and I know that when I when it comes time for me to buy another car, I probably will get a Korean car. That's the strength of K-dramas. And also, I want to go to Korea as a tourist. I, of course, I haven't been traveling much, but I really want to go because I feel like uh, this country is so fascinating. And now I feel like I know a lot about it. I've picked up a few Korean phrases <laughs> from watching <laughs> so many. But I just think such a brilliant, no country has ever done this before. And, if, you know, Japan, you ask why not Japan? Well, they're very insular. When they make their films, they're only talking to their fellow Japanese. And in China, why not China, right? Well, China doesn't have, it's not a democracy. Um, and so it's a dictatorship. So the artistic world in China is very much constrained. They're afraid of the government. So that's why Korea is unique in the world. What does the TV and film industry, how does that reflect about their society and pol- politics in Korea? Well, there's uh, there's dramas about corruption. Um, I'm watching one now. It's not on Netflix. It's on a streaming service. It's called Vagabond, and it's about corporate uh, rivalry and espionage. And it's, and it's so extreme that one company actually uh, bombs the other uh, company's plane. <laughs> uh, and I think it's those themes of loneliness, a lot of alcoholism in Korea, a lot of uh, prejudice against orphans. And they're not real orphans. They're just children born out of wedlock. Um, and so these, often the hero is an orphan and, you know, there's, he, he has to fight all these obstacles to be accepted. And I think it's, it's very universal, I think. But what I like about it is these are rough and ready theories. And what many people don't understand is they're written on the fly. So they'll start a series. Like Netflix, if you're watching stuff like, um, the Diplomat, for instance, that's already all done. When they release it, it's all it's all finished. But in Korea, they write a couple of episodes and they air them, and then they wait for audience feedback in the next day or two, and then they write the next episode. So the actors have to deal with this ever changing. They don't even know how it's going to end. It's being written as they act it, and I think it really makes it exciting. It's not all smooth and polished and plastic. It's really fun. And the actors work so hard, they have um, IV drips of vitamins. You know, they're lying on the set waiting for the new script to arrive. So it's a really, you know, different dynamic from the other stuff on Netflix. Fascinating. It almost sounds like a soap opera. Yeah, it's sort of like soap opera. They are like soap operas, but they're so much better than Western soap operas. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Great. So much for taking the time to speak to me today. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. Jan Wong is a Canadian journalist and author. Her books on China, notably Red China Blues, chronicles her many years living in and reporting on China from the 1980s onward.